Thank you for being here with us this evening. A couple of logistic um, notes. We do have restrooms that are really close by. We have a ladies restroom here, a men's restroom here, but if you need to make use of them and you don't wanna go in front of everybody, we do have them out in the hallway as well, so you can exit to the back for those. But other than that, I just want to say briefly, thank you for being in this space this evening. We are, we're lucky here. We get to work with Georgia Center for the Book and we get to host these events. We've had a really busy May with some amazing conversations that have been thought provoking and given us stuff to chew on. But we get to open up our doors and have these amazing authors and thinkers and have you all come into our space to help us grow, help us learn and challenge us. And so we are grateful that you have chosen to spend your evening here with us. And we just want to say, welcome. I have said before, so forgive me if you've heard me say this, that we do these events here because we value pebbles. And what I mean by that is, have you ever had a pebble get stuck in your shoe? It's such a tiny, tiny thing, but it just, it is all consuming. It drives you bananas until you have to deal with it. You have to take off your shoe and take out that, that pebble and, and do something about it. And what we have found here that when we host these kind of conversations, we get pebbles of all sorts. These are challenges that just rub us in just the right way that we have to deal with them. And sometimes we get really life-changing pebbles out of these events, and sometimes we get giant rocks and pieces of glass that forever change us for the better. And I feel like that is what we're gonna get this evening with Rachel, especially from what she has given us already with her body of work in her career so far. So thank you for being willing to walk with pebbles in your shoes this evening. Um, I want to turn the evening over to ER with Jaris Books and come on up. We'll wow. get this started more. Thank you so much, Shelley. Um, so my name is E.R. Anderson. I'm the executive director of Karis Circle. Karis Circle is a nonprofit programming arm of Karis Books. Karis Books is the South's oldest independent feminist bookstore. We are so, so honored to be here with all of you tonight. We are grateful always to the Georgia Center for the Book. We are grateful always to the First Baptist Church of Decatur. Um, they, they are allowing us to be in this space for free, to be in fellowship with all of y'all tonight. So thank you, thank you, thank you to all of you for being with us. It is my great honor to get to introduce tonight's amazing speakers. So Karis gets to host more than 270 events a year. Um, and part of what we love doing is celebrating people as they move through the country, move through the world, speaking their truth. And um, no one speaks their truth quite like Rachel Cargill. I assume if you are here, you already know her work. Um, we are going to begin by watching a short video, but before we do the video, I'm gonna introduce both of our speakers so that then they can come right up and be with us after the video is over. So Rachel E. Cargill is an activist, entrepreneur, and philanthropic innovator. She is the founder of the Loveland Group, a family of companies, including Elizabeth's Bookshop and Writing Center, so fellow independent bookstore owner, a literary space that celebrates marginalized voices, and The Great Unlearn, an adult learning platform that centers the teaching of BIPOC thinkers. In 2018, she founded the Loveland Foundation, offering free access to mental health care for black women and girls. Cargill is a regular contributor to Cultured Magazine, Atmos, The Cut, and her work has been featured in The Washington Post, The New York Times, and The New Yorker. Her debut memoir, A Renaissance of Our Own, is the book we are here to celebrate tonight. And she's joined in conversation tonight by someone who I assume many of y'all know well, Malik Teal, who is the founder of Curlbox, the first monthly subscription service for textured hair. A multi-hyphenate career woman with many passions and interests, she has forged a unique professional path that reflects her marketing, community building, and, and commerce expertise. Malik has spent many years as host of my Taught You podcast, organized a luxury retreat, founded an investment club, and recently launched an online community empowering black moms. Malik's work centers black women and the most significant intention behind her work is to be of service to black women who aren't afraid to do the internal work in the external success hinges on. 
Many major brands have sought her talents as a consultant and collaborator. So we're very lucky to have both of these folks with us tonight. And we are gonna begin by watching this video um, of her manifesto, of Rachel's manifesto. So if y'all can cue that up. And um, if you, before you do that, will y'all please put it together for Rachel Cargill, for my team. I am who I say I am. I shape my existence with curiosity and intention. I honor the spectrum of experiences I have had and will continue to have in this lifetime. Each experience adds to my understanding of the type of woman I decide to be. My highest values of ease, abundance, and opportunity give me guidance and recalibration toward my truth. They strengthen my yes and fortify my no. I walk confidently with the understanding that my choices are aligned. My place in the world is sacred. No one knows me better than I know me. I honor and celebrate the ways my chosen self unfolds as I learn, grow, and shift. My beliefs are rooted in my trust that my current self, younger self, and older self are all partners on my path to well-being. I surround myself with people who affirm safety, kindness, and joy. I maintain boundaries that remind me and others of my needs and my desire to be well. I show up with my very best as a daughter, lover, auntie, neighbor, and friend. I hold tight to my belief in revolution. Justice is not a passive pursuit, but one braided into every way I show up in the world. I name my privileges, being educated, financially secure, neurotypical, able-bodied, and cisgendered, and I use them as platforms to fight for the well-being of others. It's an honor to learn my way through this lifetime. I commit myself to my curiosity and interests. Gaining new and deeper knowledge, not only of myself, but also of my unique interests like art and the history of black feminism is always a worthy use of my time. I have found my work in the world to be rooted in using my genius as an activist, writer, entrepreneur, and philanthropic innovator. I do my work in a way that aligns with my values and desires. Rest is a right I hold as a human being. Knowing that my best self is my highest service, I tend generously to my rest and healing, mind, body, and soul. I give myself permission to let go of perfectionism and invest energy into simply being inspired by the living. Rachel Ooh. Cargo, there we go. <laughs> and we are on. It is so good to see you. Yes. Welcome to Atlanta. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. I'm so happy to see my book in your hand in uh, particular. I was <laughs> I was so glad when I got this book. So I had coffee with you and we talked mm -hmm. about a book and then I opened the book and I was like, <laughs> This not the book. This not the book. <laughs> <laughs> what how did you arrive at this book? Mm, I signed this book deal in 2018, and it was not, this was not the deal that I signed. <laughs> a lot of my work at the time, and I've been talking to many of my peers who also got book deals around that time, they were all rooted in the expectation that we write about racism, that we write about the racism within the feminist movement that a lot of us were speaking of, and that's what I was doing, that's what I signed the book deal for, and so I was working on it, and then 2020 came, and I was just exhausted. I was doing so much writing, so much work around um, really just hoping to convince white people that black lives mattered, and I decided I just didn't want to do my work I didn't want that to be where I was putting my energy, my effort, my craft, my time. And so I literally called my agent and I said, I will pay you the advance back. Like, I don't want to write this book. I don't want to do my work this way. And um, 
they gave me a lot of options and a lot of freedom for how this book could go forward, including me letting them know, one, I didn't want it to be an anti-racism book. I didn't want that to be the fo focus of it. And also, um, I wanted more money because I had more <laughs> followers <laughs> since then. So I got Rachel both of those things. Too. <laughs> so I always tell Rachel amongst our friends that when we are in certain situations, we are like, what would Rachel do? And it's like, Rachel would want more money. Rachel would, want, Rachel she would. would say, no, I'm not doing that. I'm doing something different. So you're going to need to pay me more mm -hmm. for the thing mm -hmm. I, I said I was going to yeah. do that I don't want to do anymore. Yeah. I love that for you. I love, I love that about you, and, and I think about you often. Mm, thank um, you. So I picked up the book, and I wondered um, why Renaissance versus reInvent? And I mm. asked that question because I have been asked pretty frequently, reinvention, reinvention. Mm -hmm. um, but there was something special about just the cover, and it says a renaissance of our own. And so... Tell me Ooh. about that. I first want to say that I had a fo in, at my DC stop. I had a follower tell me that she noticed that I have both Beyonce and Oprah in my title, both Renaissance and Own, and I love that for me. <laughs> but also, <Yes. laughs> but this title actually. I came up with this title in like 2015. It was something that I had written down in a notebook when I had first moved to Brooklyn, living in like a shoebox inside of a shoebox. <laughs> And I felt so possible. I felt so excited for whatever was about to come out of this time in New York City. Um, I had just moved from DC, I was freshly divorced and I was like, there's any, I can do anything. And I was sitting down and in that notebook I said, I feel like I'm entering a renaissance of my own. Yes. And I wrote that in the notebook. And then when I came to the book um, and when I switched the book to this memoir, I told myself that I would bring that title, which when I wrote it down, I was like, ooh, that could be a book one day. Like That sounds like a book title. And so I uh, called my editor and I said, we're going to change the book title as well. And okay. so uh, I got to stick with it. And Renaissance was something that had been on my mind all that time ago when I first landed in New York and was so intrigued by what was coming for me. Yes. Mm -hmm. So for those who haven't read the book, you tell lots of personal stories, things that I think for those of us that have followed you may not have known. Mm -hmm. And you, through those stories, you explore, I feel like, various themes that you suggest we reimagine. And so can you tell us, you know, what are some things that you have reimagined that we can mm -hmm. consider reimagining? And what I love about it is that you give work in ways, it's actionable, mm -hmm. ways that we can mm -hmm. do our work. Yeah, I felt, I felt very much so that I didn't want anyone to come to this book looking for answers. Yes. I wanted them to come looking for what questions they might need to be asking themselves. Yes. And so breaking the book down into reimagining love, reimagining education, reimagining, you know, uh, business, these things, I wanted to give like these markers of where they could go to because though the book tells my story fairly chronologically, the memoir aspect of it, each chapter dips into a specific aspect of my life that I have noticed I've done a little bit differently. Not even that I set out to do differently, okay. but when I talk to other people about their love lives, when I talk to other people about how they run their business, I see like, oh, we're doing things a bit differently and it's been really fun to pull out those themes in each chapter, but each, you know, with each chapter, there's an anecdote, a story of mine that speaks to how I came into whatever my reimagining was. But uh, at the end of each chapter, there's questions. And even inside of each chapter, there's questions. And so I am having so much fun seeing how readers are answering the questions, whether they share it in a story or they DM me and say, oh my gosh, I never considered this. I never had. Uh, even known that I could ask these types of questions. Sometimes yes. just the fact that there is a question is the, the renaissance, knowing that we have options, knowing that we can ask questions that might change things. And I, I hope that that's what my readers get from it. 
That I love that because I feel like it is for everyone. Mm -hmm. Like sometimes we feel like reimagining is for certain people, but this book just affirms that anyone who picks it up and asks the questions, mm -hmm. reimagining is for all of us. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so the book delves into the complexities of identity and belonging. Mm -hmm. um, what what ways, you know, your identity, who you are, can you talk us through some of the things that kind of changed along your path? Like, who mm -hmm. did you, when you moved to, who were you when you moved to Brooklyn? And like, mm. who were you? Who was I yesterday? Who were you yesterday? <laughs> you know, I know we just had a lovely talk, you know, of, of the backstage of like just this consistent unfolding. Yeah. But all yeah. the ways, like some of the some of the ways that you your identity, some of the ways that you've unfolded. I'm most fascinated by the way you do business. Mm -hmm. um, it's my favorite thing about you too. You're my <laughs> entrepreneurial crush. Uh, I just I love the way you do it. But we'll uh, talk about that yes. in a second. But I. It came up in conversation last night in Chicago that a major underlying theme in how I move through the world has a lot to do with worthiness. Mm -hmm. And I think that shows up in all of these chapters and all of these spaces. I tell the story of um, when I was very young, I played soccer. I was like a forward and very serious about it. <laughs> and I, I love playing sports and I was on like travel teams and winter clubs and I just was very serious about the sport and um, my mom would come to the games and in the springtime when we would be playing in the spring you know it'd be rainy and the grass would be wet and my mom couldn't always make it to the field because her, my mom had polio and her crutches would sink into the grass and my mom started a petition to get a sidewalk from the parking lot to the field so that she could come see me play. Yeah. Like, there, there weren't any other disabled parents who might use it. There wasn't another kid who she might want to see. Like, she, and, and also, she, my mom didn't make it a thing. She wasn't like, Rachel, we're about to go fight for justice. It just was something she did on Tuesday after school. Okay. There was no like, they intense, need to make this happen yeah, there wasn't me. like big lesson around it. It was just like, she truly believed that she deserved to see her child play regardless of how much money pouring concrete was going to need mm -hmm. and she did it they they literally changed the infrastructure of the sports complex so my mother could come and see me play and I, I also think about times when as a disabled woman you know I was with my mom and I was eight or nine and she couldn't get the groceries into the trunk and I definitely couldn't get the groceries into the trunk so every single time we went to the grocery store my mom was asking some random person in the parking lot to come help us to put the groceries into the trunk. And it was very much a part of my childhood to believe that I that we were worthy of whatever wow. it was that we needed in yes. these very casual ways. Right. Help us out. Like, yes, they're like, going to help. Go yes. to the store and someone's going to help yes. us. Yes, and my mom was never like, um, excuse me, <laughs> could you come over here and help? She'd be like, come over here and put these in the car. <laughs> and everyone like participated. <laughs> Nobody. Wow. No, I, I don't remember any, I don't remember one time where someone was like, um, no, no, I'm not doing that. Everyone right. show, like, met her where she brought herself. Like right. she treated, she expected other people to treat her the way she expected to be treated. And I think that even though I think my mom would have, she constantly was like, Rachel, sit down somewhere. Like, why are you doing so much? It was because she gave me that type of confidence. Yes, but the wiring. Yeah, I think some of the underlying things of what I reimagined is just me feeling worthy of asking a question or considering something new. And I, and I, I had fun with this book, finding all of the threads of that in all of these different areas of my life. Did you, speaking of that, did you run into any challenges when you were writing this book? What were some of the, I mean, it flows so beautifully, but like, did you ever get stuck? So many challenges. Yeah. You know, the biggest challenge, the biggest challenge is that um, there is a bunch of stories I was telling myself that were not true. There were a bunch of narratives in my head, a bunch of truths about myself, oh. a bunch of truths about my family, about my mother, about my sisters, that when I took a moment to fact check myself real quick before you know, I sent it off to the editor and I was calling my family and was like, what, what was it that happened? Or who was it that showed up? Or what didn't happen? There were many stories I was telling myself 
enough to believe it that I had put it in the manuscript that when I really thought about it or I really checked in on it, they just were not true. My goodness. And so this was a massive project of self. Like the stories that I was willing to share with my readers, I had to be honest. Yes. And being honest is one of the hardest parts of healing because you have to be honest first. Like we go through our lives often telling ourselves stories that keep us safe. Oh, my childhood wasn't that bad. Oh, that person didn't really harm me. Mm. Oh, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't that wild of a situation. And that is a coping mechanism to say you're you're okay. It wasn't that bad, but when you have to face the truth of it, yes. that puts you in a moment of having to feel the feelings and move through the truth of it. And that the hardest part was uncovering all of the stories I had told myself that were not true. Wow. Mm -hmm. After you had written mm -hmm. it, you're like, mm -hmm. okay, let me just run this mm -hmm. by some people. They're like, yes, no, they're like, no, no girl, what, where were you at? Because I, <laughs> you were not there when that thing happened. Yeah. My goodness. Yeah. And so that's my next question was about the role of self reflection um, in fostering personal growth mm. that you discuss in your book. Like, what is the what is the role self reflection plays um, in fostering personal growth? I feel like when we are reflecting on self, the lang I don't know if it's just the language I use or really how I feel, like I feel like I'm in deep relationship with myself. Like that line, I know me better than anyone else knows me, mm. doesn't just speak to like, don't tell me what you think about me. It, it, it's not about issuing advice or um, you know, someone telling me the truth about a story, but it's I am in such relationship with myself that I... I am the one who ushers myself to new levels. I am the one who gives me um, direction, who gives me, who helps me recalibrate myself. Did you always feel this way? Like, did you did you arrive at this, or have you always mm. had so much self trust? Well, I think a little bit is childhood trauma to where I had to care for myself okay. because I just had to. I was the able-bodied person in the room. I was the um, perhaps the most educated person in the room. So mm -hmm. I think that a lot of it has to do with the way that I could have been cared for more by adults in my world, but since I wasn't, I had to care for myself, yes. which put a deep self-trust in me. Um, but I also think that I... <laughs> Sorry, I think that I've learned that I like dream bigger than most people I meet. I think yes. different than most people I meet. And so I kind of like my ideas better than most other people's. <laughs> 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 and so I have learned to value my voice. I've learned to appreciate it. I've learned to mold it to braid in with what other people think and feel and who have expertise more than me. But I really, I, I have been through things that have insisted that I trust myself. But I think another, just thinking back to childhood, which like gives us so much of ourselves within it, you know, my mom used to like, because she couldn't, my mom couldn't play with me. Like she was on crutches, so it's not like we were running around. And so the way that she would play with me is that she would take me to a park and she'd be like, go climb to the top of that and tell me what the view is from up there. Come back and report what the view is from up there. Or she'd say, uh, go find out what that girl's name is. And in my mind, when I was a child, I thought these were like the most fun adventures. Like I thought it was so <laughs> cool. It was like a scavenger hunt of fun things to do. But I really started to consider, was my mom doing that to remind me what I was capable of mm. or to prove to herself that she had a daughter who would be capable because she knew she wouldn't always be around? Yeah. And so I really think that maybe out of necessity, my mother fostered this belief in myself. Like, you can do things, not only can you, but you have to because right. I will not be able to, you know, run and, and help you in most situations. Um, but also, like I said, kind of the... You know, when I was sick, I really had to take. My mom couldn't walk up and down the stairs. I was never carried. Oh. You know, I was in the ways that children often are. I was very self-reliant, mm -hmm. and I I hope that as an adult, I'm able to continue to alchemize that into things that are more nurturing instead of the hard of it. Right. But I do think that a lot of my uh, my self-knowing has to do with being in this ongoing relationship with myself. Even asking, like, what do you actually think, Rachel? Like giving myself a pause and saying, why are you doing this? Are you doing this because someone else wants you to? Are you doing this because you feel like you have to? I, I really do take pauses to 
be in conversation with myself. Um, but some of us are scared to be in conversation. We don't trust ourselves. No, no. Yeah. I think yeah. self-trust and as a parent, mm -hmm. that when people ask, what are my goals as a mm -hmm. parent? The number one goal is self-trust, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. is that no one knows you better than you. Yeah. And so I think that is the foundation for mm -hmm. like, a lot of what you do and the big dreams mm -hmm. and going to someone and saying, mm -hmm. I want more, yeah. you'll give me more. Put my clothes, put my groceries mm -hmm. in the truck. Mm -hmm. And I want to say that I think we can, that this isn't, you didn't miss out on it if you weren't parented that way. Correct. There's right. so much opportunity for us to do that within ourselves as adults, maybe even more because we're up against these everyday situations where we have to question why we're doing it, what we're doing, how we're doing it. And I'm, I'm grateful for the ways that I've been able to also uh, repair it myself and witness other people find um, inspiration in themselves. I like how people are inspired by what they, what they do. A question that I've been asking because I'm just curious. Mm -hmm. I think that self-awareness is easily one of the number one things that is required to also sort of grow. Mm -hmm. Do you have any tips of cultivating self-awareness um, mm -hmm. for us? Yes, no, maybe. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking that a lot of my self-awareness lately has come from my friends re reflecting me to myself. Are you, and being, are you, are you open to this? Yes, reflection? being open to it, okay. being open to it. Even like someone recent, a friend recently told me like, Rachel, you use the same five words, come with something new. Like, <laughs> like you're smarter than that. You have a bigger vocabulary. Like we all know it. And I think in my mind, it was like, those were the themes of my work, which I love having clarity about the themes of my work, but like, you're right, I am smarter than that. Like I literally can find even new ways to say the same thing. It's not that I need to go away from the conversation, it's just finding new ways to say the same thing and for me to be able to say like, oh, you're absolutely right about that. Because also, we have been taught that we have to hate ourselves to new levels. Come on. Like, I don't feel like I have to hate myself to the next thing. Yes. And we're told, like, in order to feel better in your body, you have to hate this body and then work so hard to get away from this, which you're in right now. Or to be in a, you know, to, to grow in your career, you have to be, or even style, like you have to be embarrassed by something in right. order to go to the next thing. And I just don't, I don't want to feel that way. And I don't want to think that way. So I've been relishing in opportunities to grow and change because mm -hmm. I, I think I've worked really hard to not feel like I have to hate myself to every new level. I thank you for that. Mm -hmm. I just, I'm, I feel so lucky to be able to speak with authors and to mm -hmm. the kind of work that you write. I feel like self-awareness is always that like hard mystery thing like self-care. Mm -hmm. And so hearing mm -hmm. how you uh, are self-aware is very helpful. What advice would you give to readers who want to incorporate these principles and values discussed within the book to their everyday lives? Like, I think mm. you said some of it, lots of yeah. questions, but. Well, I think in the book, I walk you all through how to find your highest values in the ways that I did. And highest values were so life-changing for me because um, they just gave me direction. They just gave me direction, maybe, they gave me like a lens, they gave me a perspective that allowed me to use it in everyday life. I talk about, you know, when I realized that ease was a value of mine, it didn't just look like me walking around and saying, I'm about to be easeful, y'all, like don't That's stress me right. out. It really was, you know, it comes up when, um, I'm trying to decide where I, how, how I want to use public transportation. You know, I live in New York City and it's, if I'm having an, if I'm really, really stressed that day or really irritated that day, I'm not going to hate myself for spending some money to be in a cab instead of going on the train. Mm -hmm. Like there's these everyday moments of saying ease is a value of, of mine and that holds so much weight compared to X, Y, Z. Maybe it's even in the food, you know, it's so stressful every day to be like, what am I about to eat day to night? <laughs> and so when I say ease, I'm, I'm not going to get mad at myself if for a week I get the same kale sandwich that I love in Brooklyn <laughs> because Ease is a value of, I'm doing something for me and I don't have to question myself. There's no other higher authority telling me what's better for me. And I can, I can move through, it, it really affects like small day-to-day -day things when you really think about 
what you want. And it's kind of like when you want a red Corvette and you see it everywhere. Like I see ease opportunities for ease everywhere. I see opportunities for abundance everywhere because that is the thing I'm looking at. I'm not, I'm not um, distracted by, and, and by distracted, I don't mean that this thing is worse. I just mean it's not my thing. I'm not, I'm not stressed about what clothes I'm going to wear okay. because I'm perfectly content with wearing my robes every day. I'm not, like she that's- She said she was going to wear her Y'all are lucky I got tour. a stylist for this tour. <laughs> yeah. Because I was going to, but it's like, I, it, it really also helps you. I wrote this recently to myself. Like, I am so choosy about what I stress about these days. Ooh. There's so many things to stress about, and I'm just not choosy. about to stress about particular things. That might be stressful, mm-hmm. but instead of, like, even, you know, I've been traveling so much on this tour, and there have been so many opportunities for me to be late to a flight or just this morning coming from Chicago. Like, it was... I, it took 30 minutes for an Uber to even accept my request <laughs> and then the traffic in Chicago. And I was just sitting in the back of the car like, this is not what I'm. This is not what I'm going to choose. Whatever happens, happens. This is not what I'm going to choose to stress about. And it has really, um, really shifted something in me to, to know my values and uh, decommit to stressing. <laughs> I... I highlighted something. It's like when I opened the author's note, and I just want to read it because I it is sort of stained in my brain, and I think it'll stick with us. It says, while I did not have a name for this feeling at the time, I think we would call it ambition. I craved a different life from the one I had been born into, mm-hmm. and I feel like that sort of just speaks to everything that you do. Do you have any ideas for, like, do you have hope for long-term impact for a renaissance of our own. Do you, like, Mm. it's released, it's out there, Mm -hmm. the words are on the page. I think that this book speaks to, I mean, I'm 34, so it speaks to a very particular age of me, obviously, a, a very particular lifespan so far. And writing is hard because who you are at that time is what's on the page. Like I've already yeah. grown a bit already from what I wrote in the book. And so How long ago did you <laughs> a, a year ago, six months ago six, is when I finished it. Six but months I've ago. Changed. Okay. okay. <laughs> right, right, right. I've grown you know, I, I have I have new thoughts. Yeah. Not not even necessarily different thoughts, but new thoughts, new new ways of considering things. Um, any you can share just because I'm curious. <laughs> I, I, I just have grown I just have uh, you know, my mother's passing has changed me, cha- mm. changed the makeup of me. Okay. And I, I feel my feelings differently. Mm. I relate to people differently. And I'm looking forward to, to the thread of that being pulled from Renaissance and moving into whatever my next writing will be because it all is the same story, yeah. but it's new, it's under new spotlights. And I think that I'm really excited for all of the people who need that part of me. This is a need. I said this to you when I walked in. I was like, this is a book that I was looking for all the times that I was scouring the bookstore. Mm -hmm. Like, this just didn't exist. And this is such a necessary book Mm -hmm. for wherever you are. Like you said, even if you weren't parented Mm -hmm. this way to have self-trust, this is this is the mm-hmm. book. Yeah, and I feel I feel proud of what of me is in these pages, and it makes me think of writers, you know, writers who we follow their career for a very long time. We want to see them change. We want to see them grow to yes. think differently because we, as the readers, want to grow and think differently along with them. And I and I am excited for you know twenty years from now when someone reads because they need that version of me. And yes. I might have written three more books by then, but they need that book that's going to get them to whatever new space they need to be in. So I think the long-term impact that I'm excited about is, um, you know, as an author, I feel like what, be, what being a writer means is that you get to be in ongoing conversation with people. It feels like this is just my, these are my words, and now I'm ready to hear you talk back. And so I'm excited for the, the longevity of conversations I might have with people who will find the book for the first time, and it will be, you know, we'll all have kind of gotten to another place in age, but there is someone who is very young right now who will be married and getting yes. a divorce, and that will speak to exactly where they're at. So I'm looking forward to how the book exists and is and 
draws the exact person who needs to read it. Right. And I think that's why I'm not worried about the, you were asking me like how I feel about the numbers. Yeah. Like I really am not so much worried about the numbers because I really am excited for the one person who needs to read it. Yeah. <laughs> like I'm excited for the specifics of who needs to read it. Yeah, I, I was curious because, you know, so many people, it's like, okay, it's am I going to do this? Am I going to, you know? Here. And I'm just like, can you, are you really enjoying mm -hmm. the beauty of the book that you wrote versus feeling like, you know, and a friend and I were just saying that even getting, you know, on these lists or something, it doesn't mean that the work is cr like critically acclaimed. It, it just really means that it, it, it really doesn't mean people... much. When when we first got into the publishing, and they're like, "Are you gonna be, like this? Could be a New York Times bestseller." I'm like, "Do I get another check when that happens?" <laughs> like, I don't what understand. What Rachel do? WWRD. <laughs> I just don't understand why we're like. I get like it is exciting, mm -hmm. and and I it's cool to see that people are picking up the book. But I want to read what people email me. Yes. I want to read what people the say tweets, to me. The the posts, yeah. the way that they're moved, the the, yeah. the reels that are gonna have. Yes. you know all of the quotes because the whole book is just. It's quotable, tweetable. It's, Thank you. Yes, all of the sentences. So I know that there are questions. There's Q&A. So yes, we, yes, if, there's, if there are to, any questions. So you can either go up to that microphone, or if you want to call upon the spirit of Rachel's mother, <laughs> you can your hand, say, bring the microphone. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Which we have, every stop has had a seat for my mom at the front oh, with flowers in it. Gwendolyn. And so I'm, yes, my mom, Gwendolyn, so I'm grateful that we were able to um, oh. honor her in each location. That is, yeah. Hi, my Hi. name is uh, Mirtha Donna Stork. Um, my question is, you are, you started the Loveland Group, the Loveland Foundation, you know, the therapy fund. Uh, and then this book, it seems like a lot of your work is to help people be better um, through therapy, through reimagining Renaissance. What is it, like why is that such a huge driver and mission for you? Such a good one. You know, I really feel like my work is to just think out loud, to mm -hmm. feel out loud, to grow out loud, to heal out loud. And so I don't even know if I'm doing it for anyone. It's just literally what I'm going through. <laughs> it's, you know, the, the Loveland Foundation started because I had just had an incredible therapy session and I was like, oh my gosh, everyone yes. deserves to have this. And so I started that, even my bookstore, I moved back home to Akron and I missed the types of bookstores that we have in Brooklyn. So I was like, okay, I guess I'm gonna start one because I want one here. And it really was, everything that I'm doing is really just me being in relationship with myself out loud. And I feel so grateful for that because I really, I, I've had such a, spiritual shifting in myself over the last several months. And I, I wish, I can't wait till we have brunch so we can really talk about this. Yes. But I, <laughs> I, really, I really feel that, you know, my ancestors are like, girl, we're going to make you as comfortable as you need to be, but the only thing you have to do is heal. Ooh. The only thing you, like, we want you to heal and do it out loud. Wow. And I feel like that's my work. I feel like there is nothing particularly special or unique about me, except for the fact that I have a platform to talk about it out loud. Mm. And so I... Uh, so you saying it seems like I'm interested in people growing. I'm interested in me growing and inviting people to join me along that way. And that's why I always say I don't, I don't have a work of being, I don't have a work of giving answers. I, I literally am just asking questions out loud and I'm actually intrigued by everyone else's answers to the questions, <laughs> to the questions too. And I, I, feel, I feel very, very grateful to get to live, grow, talk, think out loud. I feel like that's my work. Yeah, thank you for that question. Yeah. Hi, my name is Janelle Simmons. Um, I'm on my leaks newsletter and a couple of weeks ago she talked about grief mm -hmm. and with the passing of your mom, have any new questions of you come about in regards to grief? And if so, kind of what are they? 
Too many. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I've ever felt grief before. And my father passed away when I was 11. And as I was telling you, my mom, it was really hard for her to let me feel my feelings. Like, mm -hmm. whatever work she hadn't done within herself, I couldn't be too happy. I couldn't be too sad. I couldn't be too mad. She really would prefer me stay at a pretty level of pace. And now as an adult, I understand that was her own work that she needed to deal with. But I realized that I had never grieved. Mm. I, did, I, had, I really did not grieve my father at all. And so this is a brand new experience. And it's um, the, the questions that come up for me in it are, you know, who was my mother outside of my mother? Mm -hmm. <laughs> who was she as a woman? Who was she as um, a, a reader, as an artist, as a sexual being, as a, even as a mother, like what was her idea of what she was doing? What was she trying to do? What was she hoping to do? And the way that I talk to my friends now and they're like, this is what I hope for my children. Like what, was, what had my mom said to her friends about what she was hoping for the children she was raising? Um, Another thing that really has surprised me in this experience of grief is like the joys of grief. Yes. I think that those of us who have witnessed a parent die or, or just have uh, had to be a caretaker in any way, there is a deep relief of like, she is no longer suffering. You mm -hmm. know, my mom lived in Ohio. We had snowstorms all the time. And I remember, she passed in November. And I remember the first snowstorm after she passed, I was like, thrilled that I did not have to worry about her. Mm -hmm. I was just so happy that I didn't have to worry how well she was or what, she, what was going on with her. But I think that one of the most moving things for me in this experience of grief is that um, I tell the story of my mom. I got to read my mom some of the pages of my book just a few weeks before she passed. And I read it to her and she goes, wow, that was so much better than I thought it would be. <laughs> And I'm like, okay, girl. <laughs> and it, it really, uh, you know, our, our parents rarely know what we're doing. Right. They think, you know, and when I moved to New York, my mom's like, you're a prostitute. And I'm like, <laughs> like, that's the only thing yeah, she could yeah, fathom that yeah. I would be doing. Right. And it really, <laughs> like, she couldn't, she just couldn't imagine, really past her own, her right. own imagination. Right. Right. So the two things that have been really moving and surprising to me, one is that, um, my mom is now part of my work. Mm. I write about grief. There, there is no grief writing without my mother, me and my mother's relationship. So it feels like this is the first time my mother is in the, in like the nitty gritty of my work, which is really cool. And you know, her being a poor, disabled, uh, Christian woman, there were all of these containers that she existed in that I'd have to open up to get to her. And now there's nothing between me and my mother. Mm. There's nothing between us for how we, how we might relate, how I might speak to her, how, you know, even her, you know, I'm thinking about my mom rolling her eyes at me about something. Like, you can't even roll your eyes at me right now. And I'm going to tell you how I feel about X, Y, Z. There's, there's this new relationship that can happen when the physical isn't there. And I also, my newness of relationship with her is, you know, my mom had never been out of the U.S., she had never left the country. And probably six months before she passed, I had flown her to Jamaica to see me. And mm. so my mom died with one stamp in her passport oh. to Jamaica. And as she was passing, I just kept thinking, like, she doesn't even like to leave the country. How is she about to die? Like, <laughs> I knew she needed, like, her. it was very clear that her body needed to let go. Mm -hmm. It got to a point where it's like, go for the sake of all of us. And it... I was terrified for her. Like, I, I remember, like, literally whispering in my mother's ear like a child, like, it's okay, you'll be fine. Because I can't imagine how terrified, like, it's, it's terrifying to think about. And I think now I'm having this feeling of, like, wow, my mom is so badass. She did this thing we're all terrified of doing. Mm -hmm. Like, she did it. Mm -hmm. She did it. And I'm so proud of her. And, and I'm so proud of her finding the courage to do the thing that... I know she was terrified to do so. I'm, I'm so surprised by all of the new ways I'm in relationship with my mother to where loss can feel like such, it, it, can, it feels like it will truncate everything. But, for, but it, I, I've had so much joy in finding all of the new conduits to her that just couldn't exist in the physical. Mm. Yes. Good evening, thank you so much for being here. My name is Shavana Warden. 
I wanted to know about the artwork on the book cover. I am always drawn to, to covers, and yours is just amazing. So if you could speak to why this cover and if the colors mean anything. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, this was actually, I live posed for that. I was laying in the water. There was like, we used ketchup bottles to like squirt color from where my uh, fingers were. Uh, uh, the artist, her name is Sarah Stiber, and she had contacted me in 2018 and invited me. She, she was doing a project called, I think it was called like Face Forward, mm. because she had been studying advertising and most of women's presence in advertising was from the neck down or from behind. And so she was interested in doing a project that was like face forward with women. And uh, she, had, she, she was a reader of my work and she valued my work. And so uh, I flew down to San Diego and we got, she did four different portraits and this was one of them. And um, we did photography first and then she painted from the photograph. Wow. So she like was, she designed the whole thing, what it looked like, we had makeup, we had, it was a whole day of shooting, and then that's what then she painted from that. And uh, I had a, you know, the title of the book was, what was the title of the book? The original title was, I Don't Want Your Love and Light. Mm. Uh, and it was an anti-racism book, mm. and the cover was completely different. And when I changed, when I changed what the book was gonna be, and then I chose the Renaissance of Our Own, this photo just really felt like it was so applicable to how I wanted to feel, how I wanted the book to feel. So yeah, thank you, I was, I, it was fun to um, be able to call her and be like, remember that shoot we did three years ago? Yeah. It's going on the cover, yeah. Ah, cool. wow. Yeah. My name is Joel Taylor, and <laughs> I am, First of all, I want to say I'm very excited to see the journey of Rachel Cargo. Thank um, you, friend. This is my friend from college, y'all. This, this is my best friend, yeah, literally. Yeah. So while, she, while she's talking, I'm dying because I, I just know her so well. It is just, I'm over here dying. Like My cousin's like, why are you laughing? I'm like, because it's hilarious. She's funny. But I wanted to know what is your favorite chapter in the book? Mm. I think that if I had the chance to like, what, what I really love about having written this book is that I kind of let y'all know enough about everything and now I get to like deep dive into whatever I want for the next book. Mm -hmm. And I think if I could like blow out a chapter, it would probably be business, the business chapter. Yeah. I don't feel like I get to talk about business much as a- Which you are a beast, by thank the way. You, thank you, thank you. There's no one I want to hear that from, <laughs> honestly. <laughs> I'm so grateful. Yeah, I think I would blow out business or the love chapter. I, I have so much fun in love and I also have so much fun writing about it. So I'm looking forward to uh, being able to blow out these chapters because there's so much more to say about each thing. There just wasn't enough time or space. So uh, business for sure. Yes. I don't get to talk about it that much. And I don't think people know just how like amazing, like how incredible the businesses that you have built. Like, I don't know that you, I mean, I know you're in your robe. Uh oh, sorry. Oh, I think sorry. this isn't working, but okay. Um, I know, okay, you have another one. I know that you will just be in your robe, but just like the, the Loveland Foundation and all the. <laughs> just say, okay, are we Randall! Back? Like, if you. Can you share how many. Like, is, it, is there a number of vouchers or sessions or, or women and girls that you can tell us that you've served? Well, one of my favorite things about the Loveland Foundation right now, like getting the reports back, I'm not, I, 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 uh, I have a CEO and we have a staff. Everyone thinks that I'm answering phones at the foundation, but I'm not. Right. And I, so I really have enjoyed getting reports back about everything that's going on. But my biggest, the two things, well, we've given over 75,000 hours of therapy. 75,000 hours. Yeah. That's Which why I'm great. just like, yeah. come on. That's really great because it's not just the black women and girls getting therapy, but that's 75,000 paid hours to, to therapists, therapists who are all also, you know, moving through their careers, which I'm, I'm so excited about. But also, our num, our age group is moving up. It mm. used to be like we're moving into 
the people in their 40s are, we're getting more people in their 40s, more people in their 50s. Yes. And that is the most exciting thing to me because it shows that we reached our, the audience of people who were maybe around in their 20s and, and now they're like inviting their aunts and their mothers <laughs> to get therapy. And yes. I feel like this is really a beautiful opportunity for generational change for us. And I'm so, I'm so proud of what they're doing at the foundation. And I'm so happy that it came to mind that day. like an idea and then it's a thing it's right, wild right and that's what I'm saying <laughs> even as a businesswoman like you said and I am not answering phones yes I am not yes, the CEO yes you took yes, your idea and you're yes, like okay yes. Yes, I feel I feel so grateful for. Uh, in the book, I talk about I studied Oprah, I studied Beyonce, uh, not even so much for who they were. Like there were so many things I disagreed with for both of them, but mm -hmm. I was able to. What I really was inspired by was that they do whatever they want. Yeah, like they really. I when I was studying Oprah, I was like, she has a network and she has a pizza. What? <laughs> like right, she did. She just or, out here doing whatever. Like doing, doing whatever, whatever she wants. She Building wants. Building schools. Yes. Just, yes. I, yeah. And yeah. I was so inspired by that. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know if I did. I tell you, I went to Oprah's house. See how it is. <laughs> Don't. Yeah, I had this. I, I I had the experience to actually tell her all of the things that I write about in the book. Like I spoke to her, and it was such a wild experience to be there in her space. And she uh, she go. I go. You know, I built my my whole structure of my company is based on you and what I read of you. And uh, she goes. And now look at you at my house. I was like, I know. That's the issue. <laughs> this is the issue. Now I have like there's there's so many new spaces to dream and do and understand and even dis I love disagreeing with her. I love disagreeing and challenging myself to say why I don't agree and what what could be different. Mm -hmm. And um, I I'm really I'm really seduced by possibility these days. Mm. Like it's sexy, it's intriguing, it's nourishing. It's it's really the light of life for me to to be like what else could what else could happen? How else could this look? How else could it be? And I I'm grateful for all of y'all participating and <laughs> watching the arc of it. <laughs> Were there question? Hi, Ashley Hi. Stewart. I thank you for your work. Um, one of the things that I really love hearing you talk about often is um, are your values. And mm -hmm. I actually attended one of your highest values workshops oh. a couple years ago. And one of the things that I think is challenging sometimes is staying so deeply connected to your values, especially in a world that doesn't always align, especially for black women. So could you talk a little bit about how you stay so deeply connected to your values? Uh, well, I will have to say that it's rooted in a lot of privilege that I have. You know, like I work for myself and I have what I call platform privilege. Like usually I can move in a lot of ways. But as my friend Ebony Janice reminded me that I, I really was moving like that before I got the privilege. That's the only reason I can move with it now. You have to practice things, even when it's hard or it doesn't really make sense. It makes me think about when the way that I love to organize, like I, I love uh, organizing my apartment and I hired like a really wonderful organizer. Mm -hmm. And But I used to always go to like, the dollar store and get little baskets that were a dollar each and do the same thing. Like I would kind of do the same thing mm -hmm. even though I couldn't do it in, to the depth or the clarity. So I think that finding little ways to practice it wherever you are yep. is, is really important and feeling like you're worth your value now. Yes. And it's not just for when you get to a certain point in life, when you get to a certain understanding or promotion, like it's a lot of worthiness work. Like I'm worth this now. I'm not only, I'm not only worth uh, my values when I'm running the show, you're worth it when someone else is running the show and you can say to them, hey, this is something I expect. How can we shift to, to allow us to move this way? I think it's, it's so wild. The, the conversation of worthiness isn't even a conversation that I have in the book, but through this book tour, I've seen that it's such a theme mm -hmm. in in approaching each chapter. Okay. Oh, okay. Oh, let's take one more. Oh, one more, okay. and then it's our time. <laughs> Hello, my name is Missy Goss Khan, and I wanted to thank you for all the work that you do through the Loveland Foundation. I am still with my therapist Great. that I was introduced to through the vouchers Wonderful. in your program. Yeah. Um, what you do takes a lot of bravery and vulnerability. I was wondering what, how you determine what you're willing to share publicly. 
the fact that I don't consider it is the issue. <laughs> but <laughs> the fact that I don't make many deep considerations. But um, you know how I'll answer that question is that the thing that I need to work on and that my community has reflected to me which shows my lack of vulnerability mm. is that I often only share after I've figured it out. Right. Rarely am I like, I'm in the midst of this thing and I don't know what's happening. Mm -hmm. I come with the lesson, I'll come with the bow of it, but I won't, it, it's really hard for me to show the messy of it. Even if the thing was messy, I still have cleaned it up a bit before I've presented it. Mm. So I think there's still levels of vulnerability that I have to, like we said, honesty starts with self, that I have to come to myself. But also, um, I I do. I've always been a pretty vulnerable person. I've I've never felt. Uh, I'm not even like a super private person. Like I don't yeah. feel like I need to protect anything in the way that some people feel. Um, but what that does mean is that I'm often sharing. Uh, with my own curation and I have right. to be critical of myself. What am I curating? Why am I curating mm. it? What am I willing to share? And or, or I should say, when am I willing to share all of these things that I'm quote unquote so willing to share? Malik and I got together a few years ago and I, I literally sat down at the table. I was like, I thought I was vulnerable. <laughs> I wasn't yeah. like I, I, in therapy, I'm learning. I sharing isn't Sharing the thing isn't feeling the thing. Ooh. And so I was sharing some things, but I wasn't feeling those things. And once I felt them, that took me to a deeper level of vulnerability. Mm -hmm. And so I am I'm still reaching for new levels of healing and vulnerability. And so I I, I don't want to answer that with a here's how I'm so vulnerable because I so this is me practicing <laughs> 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 that I that I still have so much more work to do there. Yeah. Thank you, Rachel Thank E. You. Cargo, for coming to Atlanta <laughs> and sharing your work with us. I cannot wait for you all to, if you haven't read it already, read yes. A Renaissance of Our Thank Own. Thank you for having me. I'm not sure who we're giving Thank them. you all so very much for coming. Don't forget, Karis Books is back there. If you haven't picked up your copy, you can pick up your copy as you leave. If you haven't picked up a copy and you want to, they do have some extra signed copies back there that you can, because then you can start a renaissance of your own. Thank you all so very much for coming. We will see you all again very, very soon. Have a good evening. I am who I say I am. I shape my existence with curiosity and intention. I honor the spectrum of experiences I have had and will continue to have in this lifetime. Each experience adds to my understanding of the type of woman I decide to be. My highest values of ease, abundance, and opportunity give me guidance and recalibration toward my truth. They strengthen my yes and fortify my no. I walk confidently with the understanding that my choices are aligned. My place in the world is sacred. No one knows me better than I know me. I honor and celebrate the ways my chosen self unfolds as I learn, grow, and shift. My beliefs are rooted in my trust that my current self younger self, and older self are all partners on my path to well-being. I surround myself with people who affirm safety, kindness, and joy. I maintain boundaries that remind me and others of my needs and my desire to be well. I show up with my very best as a daughter, lover, auntie, neighbor, and friend. I hold tight to my belief in revolution. Justice is not a passive pursuit, but one braided into every way I show up in the world. I name my privileges, being educated, financially secure, neurotypical, able-bodied, and cisgendered, and I use them as platforms to fight for the well-being of others. It's an honor to learn my way through this lifetime. I commit myself to my curiosity and interests. Gaining new and deeper knowledge not only of myself but also of my unique interests like art and the history of black feminism is always a worthy use of my time. I have found my work in the world to be rooted in using my genius as an activist, writer, entrepreneur, and philanthropic innovator 
I do my work in a way that aligns with my values and desires. Rest is a right I hold as a human being. Knowing that my best self is my highest service, I tend generously to my rest and healing, mind, body, and soul. I give myself permission to let go of perfectionism and invest energy into simply being inspired by the living.